please be seated. Open your Bibles this morning for the preaching of God's Holy Word to Hosea chapter 7, page 957 in your pew Bibles, for Hosea chapter 7. We'll be looking this morning at the entire chapter. Let us draw near to the Lord and ask His blessing upon His means of grace. Heavenly Father, as we come before your word, we know we come before the word of the living God. Though written long ago with the pens in the hands of men, yet, O God, it is your word given unto us, inspired, infallible, inerrant, and holy. And therefore, it is a sure word, a true word, O God. It brings your revelation unto us. It declares your truth, your mind, your heart. There is nothing amiss, O Lord, in your word. What it speaks, it speaks well. We pray, therefore, that we would have a heart to submit unto it, to hear, give us ears to hear, and a heart to receive these things. For this, O Lord, is the work of your Spirit. In and of ourselves, O, o God, we turn away from your word. We deafen our ears and harden our hearts. We shut our minds to these things that can be so piercing at times. But work in us by your Spirit that we might welcome your truth, that we might welcome, O Lord, even its work in our very hearts and minds. For by it we are able to draw near to you again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hosea chapter 7, this is the word of God. When I restore the fortunes of my people, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief breaks in, and the bandits raid outside. But they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. By their evil they make the king glad and the princes by their treachery. They are all adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the princes became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with mockers. For with hearts like an oven, they approach their intrigue. All night their anger smolders. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength, and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine they gash themselves, they rebel against me. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Thus saith the Lord. Well, as we well know by now, the prophets of the Old Testament were raised up at a time in the life of Israel when things were not good. God had brought them into the land, God had dispossessed the Canaanites before them, and God had settled them into their covenant inheritance. He had raised up David as king to defeat all their surrounding enemies, and then he had raised up Solomon to build the temple. So that under David and Solomon, the typical kingdom promised to Abraham was effectively realized. But no sooner, of course, was the kingdom in hand than Solomon's idolatry led the way to division, to decline, and ultimately to disaster. And as first Israel and then Judah became more and more idolatrous and immoral, God sent chastising providences like we read in Leviticus 26 that he said he would. 
He sent chastising providences like famines and wars to call his people back because the way in which they were going was not good. And along with it, he raised up the prophets as covenant lawyers to interpret God's chastisements, to charge the people with their sins. You've turned away. You've gone away from the Lord. You've broken covenant. And to threaten further judgments, even exile, if they didn't repent and return to the Lord. And that's why the books of the prophets are so filled with words of judgment. Because the people continued in a willful breach of the covenant and they, re- con- they refused to repent. They kept going farther and farther and farther away from God. Now last time when we looked at chapter, at the end of chapter 6, we looked at the disastrous effect that breaking covenant with God has on others. And we learned that breaking covenant with God inevitably results in breaking covenant with men. Which is to say, as we made a point to say then, a people marked by vertical idolatry will soon be marked by horizontal hatred. Because when we turn our backs on God, we abandon the vertical tie to godliness and to morality. And we can't avoid then becoming a people whose horizontal lives are godless and immoral. Well, in chapter 7, we learn yet now another disastrous effect of breaking covenant with God. And this time we learn how it affects ourselves. In Deuteronomy 6.24, you may remember that Moses taught the people of Israel that God gave them his laws and his statutes, says Moses, for their good. And throughout the Mosaic literature, we read several times how Moses told them again and again that if they feared the Lord their God and they walked in God's ways, it would go well with them. In other words, the promise that we find attached to the fifth commandment was the promise attached, says Moses again and again, to the covenant as a whole. Keeping covenant with God, in other words, is not only the right thing to do, it's the most beneficial thing to do. Because we were created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And when we do, we find God full of blessings. We find life full of happiness. God's ways are full of pleasantness and peace. And as we said earlier in the reading of Leviticus chapter 26, we can't earn these things. It's God's way of making very clear to us that there is a way that is full of blessings. A narrow way, Jesus might say. And there is yet a broad way that is full of hardship and sorrow and misery. So it serves the reason then that breaking covenant with God is not only the wrong thing to do, but it's also the most costly thing to do because of the disastrous effects that covenant breaking has on oneself. And again, as Leviticus 26 made clear earlier, it's not for our good to walk contrary to God. It will not go well. And in today's chapter, that's just what we learn. Now, this is a long chapter. There's a lot here, and I'm not going to be able to cover it all. But I want to walk through the chapter in several quick steps, and then we'll reflect upon it at the end. But come to verse 1 with me as we begin. The first thing that sets the stage for the entire chapter, the first thing we're told is the disposition of the Lord himself. As we've been learning from our afternoon study, the Lord's disposition with Israel is the disposition of the covenant of grace made with their father Abraham. He's chastising his people. As you read this chapter, we know the history of Israel. He's chastising his people for their sins because he is of too pure eyes to look upon evil. And furthermore, because the people of a holy God should themselves be holy. And he has sent now prophets like Hosea to charge them with their wrong to threaten them with exile even, because they've ignored his warnings. They're willful in their obedient disobedience, and they're arrogant, and they're persistent in their unbelief and in their idolatry. He's chastising them. He's raised up prophets to preach hard sermons against them, yes. And yet, for all that, the text itself says that he stands with arms open wide, ready to forgive, ready to restore, heal, and turn all their curses into blessings if they'll confess their sins and return to the Lord as their God. In other words, that's the point of what the Lord says in verse 1. He says, when I would heal Israel, when I would heal Israel, then in verse 13 he says, I would redeem them. Because you see, this is the nature of the covenant of grace. 
in the covenant of grace. There is no place for willful sin because it is a covenant to redeem people from sin, to rescue them and to redeem them from sin. But there is a place for the forgiveness of sins because it's a covenant for sinners who repent. And so we need to understand this this morning, beloved. The Lord our God is a God who will by no means clear the guilty. And He is a God who will lovingly and graciously chastise and humble a disobedient people. But He's also a God who will forgive the iniquity and the transgression and the sin of all who turn to Him in repentance. Because this is the nature of the covenant of grace that He has made with Christ and us in Him. That every sinner who comes to Him through the door of Christ's atoning sacrifice will be forgiven, will be healed, will be restored, will be redeemed. In a covenant of grace, grace is on tap for all who humbly ask for it. The provision is built in the covenant itself. But of course, the sad part of this story is that although, although God held out His hand of mercy to Israel, and verse 1 says, when the Lord would redeem them, they dealt falsely with God. And in verse 13, we read that they turned their backs and they strayed from God. Now, one of the most amazing and unexpected shifts in Scripture is the likes of what we find in Ephesians chapter 2 when we read, as you well know, of our helpless, hopeless condition as condemned sinners only to see the next words say, but God. We stand amazed, we stand in awe of God's intervening, undeserving grace to us. But God, where would we be but for God's grace? Well, what we read here, and so often in the prophets, of course, is equally stunning. It's equally amazing, but in a heartbreaking sense. In the face of God's gracious offer of covenant mercy and pardon. And in the face even of the ministry of God's providences to them and now God's prophets to them. All designed to woo Israel back from their road to ruin. We're shocked and appalled to read in this verse the equivalent of, but Israel. God says, I would redeem them, but Israel dealt faith, faithlessly, falsely with God. When God put out His hand to them, and with lady wisdom in Proverbs chapter 9, said to the simple, Come unto me and be wise. Come unto me and it will go well with you. It's then, the text is saying, it's then at the very moment when the gospel is held out, in the very moment when God condescends to show mercy to an undeserving people. It's then, says the text, it's then that Israel despised God. It's then that Israel rejected God, ignored God, and turned with even more resolve into the ways of folly and self-destruction. God is not cold toward them. God is not distant from them. They've not waited upon God and then said, I give up. He's not coming. The Lord stands before them in His providences. He stands before them in His prophets. He stands before them in the offer of mercy and gospel. When God holds forth mercy, it's then, says the text, that they spurn it. They dealt falsely. They dealt dishonestly. They dealt hypocritically with me, says the Lord. They professed love. They professed devotion. They professed obedience. Saying like their fathers said to Moses in Exodus 19, all that the Lord commands of us we will do. Saying like their fathers even said to Joshua in Joshua 24, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. But verse 13 says it was all a lie. Like their fathers in the wilderness, none of it was mixed with faith. None of it was from the heart. None of it was out of a love for God. It was all motivated by selfish desires to try to appease God so that they could get God's blessings and as James chapter 4 says, spend it on their sinful idolatries. Israel had a take and break policy. They take God's blessings and then break the covenant. Jeremiah weeps over this falseness of God's people, even in Judah. Remember Hosea speaking mostly to Israel. Jeremiah says the same of Judah in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3, when he said, They bend their tongues 
like a bow. Falsehood and not truth has grown strong in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. We hear the same thing from Isaiah in chapter 1, verse 4. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. And here now Hosea preaches to the same audience. His sermons are filled with words of judgment and woe. But the judgments have been ushered in by Israel's own covenant breaking. You see, in a covenant of grace, judgment is never God's first word. Mercy is, because a sacrifice has been offered. Atonement has been made. The lamb has been slain. Mercy is always God's first word. But when we persist in rebellion like Israel is here, that word of mercy gives way to words of painful judgment. Standing in a covenant of grace, God stands unchangeably ready to pardon, to heal, to restore all sinners who will cast themselves upon his mercy and turn from their their rebellious ways. But Israel, humanly speaking, we would say that their rebellion has forced his hand. Isn't that what Leviticus 26 sounds like? Their rebellion forces his hand yet again and again and again and again until they're gone from the land. But again, as we saw there, so we see here, the underlying hope here is that the very covenant which chastises them is the very covenant which contains provisions for their forgiveness if they'll but turn and call upon him in true faith. But again, the point of the passage is to show us not only that Israel did not repent, But the point of the passage is to show us the disastrous effect that their rebellion has on themselves. And we'll look at this in two stages. First of all, look at verse 2. Verse 2 contains the problem in a nutshell. When the Lord says, they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Brothers and sisters, this is the greatest consequence of breaking covenant with God. Of all the effects that follow in the remainder of the chapter, this is the mother load that we do not consider that God sees. This is the great lie of sin when its hook is in us. That God does not see. God does not take into account. Listen to the psalmist describe the wicked in Psalm 10. Verses 11 and 13, the wicked say in their hearts, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He'll never see it. God will not call to account. And in Psalm 36, David says, There's no fear of God before the eyes of the wicked, for he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. But what a lie this is. In fact, this is the perfect cheat. This is the perfect cheat. One of the crowning achievements of sin in the heart of man is when it deceives us into thinking that God does not see our sins. We think think that God is like us. And if man cannot see, then God cannot see. Sin has gotten a great victory over us when we're so bold and daring to carry on in sin, even in the light of day, because we've stopped considering that the Lord sees, that God records, that God remembers, and God will judge. And this is what the Lord says here. They may not consider it, says God, but I remember all their evil. He says their sin surrounds them like a, like a host, a horde, a cohort of evil. And then he says they're all before my face. They're all committed in my presence. I remember them all. Again, In Psalm 10, although the wicked deceive themselves by saying God does not see and God won't call to account. In verses 14 and 15, the psalmist replies, But, O Lord, you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into into your hands and call the wickedness of the evildoer to account. In other words, God sees them all to bring them all to the day of judgment. The psalmist says something similar in Psalm 94. In verse 7, the wicked says, The Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive. But in verses 8 to 11, the psalmist retorts, Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eyes, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are but a breath. 
And it's because of this self-deception that Israel so boldly gave themselves to idolatry. They know that it was Yahweh who brought them out of Egypt. They're not ignorant. They know it was because of Yahweh that one could put a thousand to flight and two ten thousand in a war. They know it was Yahweh whose covenant gave them their rains in season and their harvest each year. And yet still, this is their evil, says the Lord. In verse 3, he says they're all adulterers. None is righteous, no, not one. And as you read through the chapter, what do we find? Their kings, their rulers, their priests, they're all idolaters. And the people love to have it so. Why? Because the people are just the same. And it's not just that they worship idols. God says they're bent on it. Listen to the language of the text here. God says they're bent on it. They're, they're mad for it. They're feverish about it. They're consumed with it. Look at how the Lord describes their passion in verses 3 to 7. He says they're like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir or stoke the fire because it needs no help staying lit. It's like they're predisposed toward idols and they're always on fire for idols. He says their hearts smolder with anger all night long and as soon as the morning dawns, it bursts forth with iniquity and blaze like a flaming fire. Again, he says, like an oven which consumes its fuel so they devour their rulers, they provoke their leaders into the same sin. So that instead of leading the people in righteousness, even the princes we read, even the princes get sick with a hangover and bring shame to themselves by their drunken stupor. Yet the Lord says, for all this, none of their kings call upon me. Why? Because even they have fallen. In fact, if you know Israel's history, you know the kings were ringleaders, leading the people into more and more idolatry on every high place after every foreign god. From Jeroboam on, Israel never had a good king. I would redeem them, says the Lord, but they're all, idol they're all adulterers and they're all hot as an oven on fire with their lust for idols. Is it not then, can we not see what a great mercy it is that the Lord was so patient with them that God didn't strike them down in the midst of their sins? We even saw this in Leviticus 26. But we see it here. That God instead sent one prophet after another to graciously open his arms of mercy to them in the preaching of his holy word. What were Isaiah? What were Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Hosea and Micah? but all signs of the Lord's mercy, even as these prophets came to preach judgment. Yet they always held out their hands to any and all who would repent and return to the Lord. Judgment is coming, they would say. Repent. Repent and avoid judgment. Repent and come back. Why would you continue? Ezekiel 18, the Lord says this. Why would you continue? Why would you burn? Turn. I take no pleasure in the death of anyone. But again, the point here is that Israel didn't turn. And the reason is not only because they were consumed with idols, but also because of idolatry or covenant breaking. It's not a harmless evil. This isn't a benign thing they're doing here. No sin is benign. Instead, it has disastrous effects on those who commit it. In fact, turning our backs on God is a foolish choice for self-destruction. It will not go well. It cannot go well. Just look at verses 8 to 16. And let me show you how radically their rejection of God impacted their spiritual condition. The Lord says here there are at least seven consequences that I counted. At least seven consequences which the people of Israel were suffering for the worship of their idols. Seven disastrous effects because they broke covenant with God. And we can only list these this morning. First of all, we see that they're ruined. In verses 8 and 9, they're deceived. Verse 9, they're stubborn and incorrigible. Verse 10, they're senseless and foolish. Verses 11 and 14, they're rebels against God. Verse 14, they're liars to God. Verses 13 and 16, and they're under God's judgment. 12, 13, and 16. Nothing has gone well. Again, we remember... How Moses said to their fathers that the Lord gave them his laws and statutes and rules for their good, that they might live long in the land as a prosperous and happy people. 
But nothing good, this is the point, nothing good can come of turning away from God. Because no matter how we try to justify it, no matter how we try and disguise it, no matter how we try and deny it, the wages of sin is death. Death to all good, death to all happiness, death to all blessings, death to all peace and joy, because sin is death to the fellowship of God. Sin separates you from God. As John 1 says, you can't walk with God in the light if your heart is bent on darkness. You can't. The light and the darkness cannot occupy the same space. And God is light, and him is no darkness, no none at all, says John. You see, Israel was deceived by their love of sin to think that the Lord was holding something back from them. God's keeping back something good. There's something good on the other side of the fences that God has set up. The grass is greener on the other side. They're convinced because they're deceived by sin into thinking that the Lord's ways are constricting, that the Lord's ways are a hindrance to true freedom, true happiness, true abundance that more awaits me outside of God than God has in store for me. But the farther away from God they went, the farther they went away from the very things they were seeking. What they sought was good, peace, joy, happiness. These are good things, life. But the problem is to seek them apart from God is to actually leave them behind. Because those things are only in God. And the farther they went from God, the farther also they went into that darkness and into that blindness and into that ignorance with which sin deceitfully rewards all its slaves. Because all light, all sight, all truth are only in God. This is why the prophet says, why the psalmist says, those who worship idols become like them. They stop being able to hear the word of truth. They stop being able to see the ways of God. Their heart grows numb to the things of God. They have no taste for God's ways and God's word. They become like the idols that they worship. This is why David says in Psalm 16, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. And what is that other God? Anything and everything apart from God. So again, it's not only right to worship God, but it's good to worship God. It's good because it's right and it's good because God is good to all who love and trust and honor and serve Him. That's why Psalm 19.11 says of God's ways, By them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Good. Good are the ways of God. Not because we can earn that good. It's all a gift. We're undeserving. We deserve hell. But the ways of God are good because God loves to give good to those who seek Him in His ways. None of us will ever be perfect in the way of righteousness. None of us will ever do well. But we can seek the right. We can walk in the ways of the right. We can seek God, imperfect as we are. And what will God do? But bless, bless, bless. He delights to give. He gives freely. He knows what we deserve. He knows we can't earn. He knows we can't pay back. He knows we'll never measure up. And yet he still gives and gives and gives. Because that's who he is. That's what he does. And that's what his ways are like. Israel was determined as Adam and Eve before them and as often our own hearts. And every sinner in fact. We're determined to find what God is hiding. We're determined to find the good that God is keeping from us. That's the lie in the garden. In all the good of all creation. Yet the very thought that there was even one good thing outside of what God had given me was enough for Adam and Eve to sin. How forgetful we become of the abundance of goodness when we set our heart on the one thing that we're convinced is good that God's keeping from us. But the reality here, the reality is God is showing us that on the other side of these fences is nothing good. On the other side of the laws and the statutes and the rules and the ways of God, no good is out there. You see, as we think this morning about what the Lord would have us take away from this chapter, I want to suggest three lessons for us this morning. First of all, we need to remember just this very thing. 
we need to remember that when the Lord exposes the sinfulness of Israel on the pages of Scripture, which He does again and again, the intent is to show us our own natural sinfulness. In other words, to look at Israel's blatant rebellion, to look at their hard-headed stubbornness, their foolish choices, their hard-hearted persistence in sin, and their proud resistance against the Almighty, who can't be wrestled, who can't be overcome. And when we look at Israel, to look at sinful Israel is to look in a mirror and to see what we all are by nature. In other words, dear church, what we read here in this chapter, this law of sin, this is the law of sin in our members, says Paul. This is the old man on display. This is the body of sin which runs with abandon away from God. This is who we all are and what we all do by nature. None of us can stand above Israel and look down at them. We're on par. This is level ground. We are these sinners. God holds out his hand to us in the gospel. And what do we do? All of us by nature. We turn a deaf ear. We don't want to hear anything about Jesus. God holds out his hand to us when I would do them good. We run headlong in that inexplicable, irrational pursuit of our own destruction. As if nothing can turn us away from the nutty determination to destroy ourselves. All of us know this. Any of us who walks with God today knows what we were like before we walked with God by His grace. You would think we were determined to damn ourselves. We were determined to ruin ourselves. So determined we were to run the road of sin and destruction. So why does the Lord show us, why does God show us this? This picture of Israel. Why would the Lord keep this picture of the natural man before his people? It's very simple. First of all, to keep us humble. God would keep us humble by reminding us not only what we were before God saved us, but also what we still are in part. As Paul says, this law of sin is still in us. As all our own backslidings can sadly testify. We are all capable of of all sin because that's the law that's in our members the Lord would keep us humble we can't stand in judgment over anyone thinking that we are better secondly the Lord also keeps this mirror before us to remind us to magnify the riches of God's mercy that graciously transferred us from what we were by nature to what we are now by grace here's a clear testimony to the fact that our salvation is the gracious work of a loving God We did not contribute a single thing to our salvation except as the undeserving recipient of his free bounty, which means every day of our lives should be a day marked by humility and worship, that we're not still what we once were. And also the Lord, as we're trying to make clear in this and the prior sermon, the Lord would have us never forget the effect of, that willful sin will have on the human heart, mind, and soul. If we allow hypocrisy to creep into our worship, if we allow duplicity to creep into our obedience, if we allow our pride or selfishness to creep into our walk with God, we won't be the better for it. Instead, it will blind us to the goodness of God. It will deafen us to the word of God. It will harden our hearts against the discipline of God. And it will show slowly but surely lead us away from God into nothing good and no place safe. You can't harbor sin, beloved. It ruins you. It ruins you. So we need to heed the Lord's illustrative warning here that sin is deadly lest we be deceived by our own sinful hearts into thinking that we will somehow fare better than Israel if we walked in their ways, that it'll be different with us. And the reality is it won't. The mirror is here for a reason. God doesn't delight to put his people's sins on display. God abhors sin. But he shows us Israel. He shows us David. He shows us 
Aaron. He shows us Moses. He shows us his people, and he shows us their sins to remind us of his amazing grace, to keep us humble, and to warn us. Sin is deadly. The pages of Israel's history are meant to show us the good, the bad, and the ugly. What sincere faith looks like, what rebellion looks like, and what hypocrisy looks like. And it behooves us to strive to imitate the good that we see in Israel's history and to steer clear away from where they went wrong. Secondly, this morning, another lesson I hope you can take home with you is that we need to be convinced that the only hope for fallen sinners is to receive a new nature from God. Like Ezekiel 36 says, we need a complete overhaul. We need a new heart, a new nature, a new spirit. Salvation is not a change of clothes. It's not a change of mind. It's not a mere change of heart as a whim. It's not a change of address. It's not a change of company. It's a change of nature. It's a complete change on the inside in order to radically impact the entire outside. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, When God saves us, the old passes away, and behold, the new comes. And it comes in spades. It comes in full force. It comes with divine power. It comes on a mission to mortify all your sins and to sanctify your whole man. The change that God brings in salvation is radical, it's whole, it's entire, it's sustainable, and ultimately in glory, it's permanent. That's what God is up to. That's what he does. So let this chapter this morning, let this chapter convince you, dear church, that there is nothing in your old man that God can work with. There's nothing that God can use in you for a starter pack. Everything in the old you is bent on sin, bent on idolatry, bent on the pursuit of a self-destructive self-righteousness. Everything in your old self, says Paul, is at enmity with God and would rather break than bend, rather die than surrender. That's you. That's me. That's us by nature. So we need to look at this chapter and be thoroughly convinced of the Bible's teaching on man's total depravity. And that salvation is therefore not only entirely the work of God alone, but it's also entirely by grace alone. There is no place for boasting. God gets all the glory if you know him by grace today. And therefore, thirdly, and finally, how thankful we should be that this is the kind of change, this kind of change that is needed for sinners like us, that this is the kind of change Christ brings to all who believe on him, that this is the kind of change preached in the gospel today. How thankful we should be that although God knows how bad off we are, and God knows how hopeless and helpless we are to save ourselves, yet he is pleased to hold out his hand to us with every blessing we need. You see, it's God who gives us faith to believe. It's God who gives repentance to come. It's God who gives the heart to love and the, the mind to know and the will to obey. God comes in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to those who have nothing. And he comes to them with everything. He comes to give everything for free. So that in the gospel of God, Jesus Christ is held out to sinners like us as a complete savior. A savior who comes to make all things new. A savior who radically, who comes to radically change and redeem the whole man for the sake of the glory of his holy name. That he might be savior, redeemer, and none other. I can't but ask you this morning, dear friend, have you experienced this kind of holistic change. Remember, salvation is not a change of address or a change of company, a change of clothes. It's a change of the whole man, dear church. Have you experienced this, my friends? Have you experienced this holistic, radical change? If not, then whatever you are today, you're not born again. You're not a Christian. But today... The gospel is preached to you. And today can be the day of salvation for you. Don't wait a moment longer, dear friend. Call upon God in prayer today and ask him to save you from your sinful condition. Ask him to give you that new heart. Ask him to let the redeeming work of Jesus be worked into your heart and your life today. 
because the Bible says he is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in faith, he will be found, he will save, because that's who he is, and that's what he does. And if you already know this change which Christ brings, dear friends, then two things stand before you as you leave this place. Number one, that you rejoice in God. That you rejoice that God in his grace has made you a new creature in Christ. Rejoice that you've been delivered from the bondage of idolatry, from the self-destructive pursuit of a self-righteousness. And that you've been brought into fellowship with the true and living God. And secondly, resolve. Resolve by the grace of God to live as one so changed. As Paul says, to live as one alive to God. To live as one in love with God. To live as one whose conscience is tender to the sanctifying and convicting work of God's spirit. To live as one conscious of what pleases the Lord. Conscious of his ways, his rules, his laws, the way that is good and right. And therefore live as one devoted by his grace and help to the way of his commandments. However much this description of Israel today could be applied to your yesterdays. Resolve today to live henceforth as a man or a woman, a boy or a girl in whose soul the very life of God is at work conforming you to the beauty and the holiness of our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. Because Christ came to save you from your sins that you might walk before God in him acceptably and holy. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you this morning for your good word. We confess it, oh God. Indeed, we declare it a good word. Though it has pierced our hearts deeply, O oh God, and convicted us in many ways, yet we confess it is a good word because it brings also the hope of the gospel. We thank you for your law that pierces our hearts, O oh Lord, and shows us what we are, that you cast us down from that arrogant and proud place where we stand in judgment over another, where we condemn others and laugh at others and mock others and seek to destroy the lives of others. But, O oh God, you cast us down before this mirror and show us that we too are sinners. Indeed, we all have gone astray. Thank you, O oh God, for the law that pierces us and convicts us of our wrongdoing. But thank you also, O oh God, that today you give the gospel, that today the gospel is preached, Christ is held forth as the one who paid the penalty for our sins and the one who rose that we might have new life. O oh Lord, draw us near unto this, our <laughs> Savior. Grant to us this day a, a hope and a love in Christ, for he is the one who brings the good news. Thank you, O Lord, for your church. Minister to the hearts and the lives of all. We commit ourselves now to you, casting ourselves upon your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.